Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Curtis, if I haven't met you. And uh, I'm Carol's husband. And uh, we're just glad that you're here. And tonight, we're, we're, we've been doing these speaker series on mental health on different topics that we actually ask people what they want to hear. And we all know that anxiety and stress is something we always deal with, but we know that in the last year and a half, we've all dealt with it probably more than we ever wanted to. And so uh, we have a friend tonight, uh, Dr. Patricia Hill, and she is going to be sharing with us. Dr. Hill is a graduate of USC, um, and she has practiced in multiple settings. Uh, she really enjoys continuing to learn and to add to her understanding of how to help people. And um, she's going to share with us tonight about anxiety, panic, and stress. And so we're going to record Dr. Hill's portion. Um, and then uh, are we st also going to record the question and answer, Carol? No. No, just the Dr. Hill's portion. Okay. So um, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. And then we'll let Dr. Hill share, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for this night. Thank you that we hope we got everything together for the tech technology. Lord, be with Dr. Hill. I know it's been hard to get her camera to go on. So pray that she wouldn't um, feel flustered and that we would just have a good night, Lord. Um, pray that this would just add to our ability to understand how you want us to take care of ourselves and deal with the stress and anxiety that comes our way. So Lord, we thank you for everybody who's here tonight and those who are still on their way. May this be a blessing to us all. And we ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey. So, um, hello everybody. And uh, this is actually kind of a poignant evening with when it comes to anxiety, panic, and stress because my camera worked earlier today and now my camera doesn't work. So we're going to just go with the flow and do our best um, to accommodate the situation. So the, the first slide um, that I want to talk about uh, is with, uh, in regards to normalizing the all too often human experience of anxiety. And Basically, what I talk about a lot to my clients when they come in is I let them know that anxiety is really something that humans are not immune to, that we all experience some form of anxiety um, in our lives. Um, anxiety, fear, acute or even prolonged stress, even panic attacks. But we're not alone. And um, you know, we just talked earlier about how uh, since the pandemic, um, our lives have really changed and become quite uncertain. Um, none of us would have ever imagined the fear of getting very ill or dying from a virus. We wouldn't have imagined isolating ourselves from others, going on to wear masks for prolonged periods of time. But this really has heightened um, anxiety in many of us. And even the most laid back of us may feel a bit of a Move on to the, to the next slide, which is definition of anxiety. So what is anxiety? Well, some of us refer to anxiety as feeling of fear, or worry, or ill at ease, being on edge. Uncertain and Dr. Hill, can you wait one second? Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask people, can you hear and understand Dr. Hill? No? Shake your head or nod your head? Shake your head. Yeah. Dr. Hill, we're having a hard time hearing you. Is oh. there any, any way you can speak closer to your mic? Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna okay. So we can start with the definition of anxiety. Okay, so under the definition of anxiety, many times we feel a feeling of fearfulness or worry, 
Um, we may feel like we're on edge. We may feel tension and nervousness. We may even have difficulty concentrating. Sometimes we feel fatigued, tired, irritable. And with anxiety, many times we have sleep disturbances. Most of the time we sleep too little, we can't fall asleep because our nervous system is kind of in a state of overactivation. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I think so. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. When anxiety heightens, sometimes we can even tremble, we can have increased blood pressure, we can begin to have clammy hands or sweat, and we can feel dizzy or lightheaded. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the clients that I have treated and some examples of anxiety that we don't typically think of, but sometimes each of us may have a unique situation or something in our body that heightens us to know that we're feeling anxious. I used to, I treated a woman um, who when she became very anxious and stressed, she would have a flare up of asthma. And so she didn't really realize that she was anxious. Maybe something stressful had happened in her day. Maybe she was busy studying for an exam and was worried about how she was gonna do on it. But her flare up of, of asthma would help her become more aware of it. Wow, something is going on inside of me and it's creating more, I'm feeling more anxiety. I had another middle-aged um, man who would develop hives when he was anxious. So again, kind of a, a nervous system response to feeling fear and anxiety. And then just recently, I had um, an older woman who became highly anxious. She noticed the sensation of tingling in her legs and her hands, along with the feeling of her heart rate was increasing, um, which, you know, when you have these kind of physical sensations, it actually increases more anxiety for you because you don't know what's happening. What's happening to my body? Why is this happening? So in our um, diagnostic and statistical manual, it's called the DSM, and that's what psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists use to diagnose disorders. Um, what we really look at is, are people having these kinds of symptoms that I just described for about a six month period of time? And that might sound like a long time, but actually if we may, if we're more predisposed or if we've had um, a lot of anxiety provoking situations, that six month period of time may, may go by pretty quickly. And then we are diagnosed with what we call generalized anxiety disorder if we um, fit into that criteria. So that is anxiety um, kind of in a nutshell. But what I wanted to do um, is talk a little bit about panic, okay? So panic is kind of a, an acute form of anxiety. Um, it comes on sometimes very quickly. We don't even realize all of a sudden we're in a state of panic. Um, it's very distressing and I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. Um, I kind of wrote down here. I don't really have any enemies that I know of, but if I'm just saying this to get the point across, if I did have an enemy that wanted to do me harm, then I might experience panic. Aaron Beck is a, uh, he was, I think Aaron Beck is right now. He was a, a medical doctor that worked in the field of uh, cognitive therapy. And he wrote a book back in 1985 about anxiety. And he talked about panic attacks. He said they seem to signify helplessness in the face of serious danger. Interesting back at that time when he wrote the book. Um, that may be true, but sometimes we can have panic attacks when we don't even feel like there is a serious danger. Um, what I have noticed in my practice is that when people have prolonged stress or prolonged anxiety, they may be a little bit more predisposed predisposed to having a panic attack. 
um, they may even feel like, oh, I'm better. Let's say they had work stress and they felt like, oh, wow, whatever the situation was, it's resolved. Or my boss is treating me nicer this week. I, I'm really um, feeling a lot better. But if the stress went on for week after week and we were in a state of anxiety and fear, then their nervous system may not have just yet calmed down. And they may experience kind of a sudden um, acute state of panic. And when that happens, kind of all of the things that I talked about with anxiety come to a head. We could have an experience like our heart is racing. We feel like we're having a heart attack. We feel pressure on our chest. We're having sweats. Um, our blood pressure is changing. Maybe we're having um, abdominal or GI uh, problems. Um, but usually a panic attack will come on fairly quickly. And many times it can resolve itself within minutes. Um, I've had people in my office with panic attacks and sometimes it can resolve itself within minutes, especially if I work with them on things are gonna be okay. This is going to pass and kind of knowing, okay, this is what's happening to my body. Um, it's, it's filled with a bunch of stress hormones and this is going to pass. And so working on telling yourself that and on breathing, slowing the breath down, trying to calm down that nervous system. And it typically does dissolve very quickly. Um, some people will have them for just a few minutes and some people will go on for, I've had people in my office who are in that state for 20, 25 minutes. Um, fortunately, when they're with me, we can just work on ways of um, creating um, a sense of safety and work on calming skills. And then their body will try to get back to what we call homeostasis, like a sense of balance in it. Sometimes after people do have panic attacks, what I've found is they may, may feel exhausted. They may feel emotionally and physically worn out from all of those stress hormones that have been released into their, into their body. And I do tell them that. I say, you know, you might just feel a little exhausted or maybe you still feel anxious. Maybe that anxiety did not completely go away. Aaron Beck, when he talked about anxiety um, and panic, he looked at cognitions. So what he thought was that a person's way of thinking might create um, the ability for panic to form. Um, then it would go from anxiety maybe into panic. So the cognition, he uses an example of a person that feels like they might have eaten something that wasn't, that wasn't right, something was wrong. And they begin to have some GI discomfort. Um, we've all kind of eaten something once in a while and we think, oh wow, something did not agree with me. Was it, you know, the food, um, maybe, uh, maybe something was bad that I shouldn't have had. And so the cognition Beck looks at is something terrible could be happening. And so you think like that, and then the physiological reaction experience that you have in your body is, wow, my whole nervous system is revving up. I have a rapid heart rate. I feel kind of faint. I'm having more abdominal sensations. I'm sweating. Oh my gosh, something must be really wrong with me. And so the affective experience, meaning emotional, could be high anxiety, fear, and worry. Maybe even a sense of dread. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I feel a sense of losing control, which is one of the things that really stands out with panic. It is a sense of losing control. I'm no longer in the driver's seat. I got pushed into the back seat, and panic is in control of the driver's seat. And then building on more fearful thinking and then more activation of the nervous system. So I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but um, the key is to try to understand what's happening to the body. I've worked with some people who have actually wound up in emergency rooms because they thought they were having a heart attack and it really felt like one, but actually it was a panic attack. 
And so the next time they might experience that, they learn some skills to um, work with that. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, defining derealization and depersonalization. Um, which is an interesting aspect of what might happen when our body basically is flooded with stress hormones. So derealization, when we experience that, we may have a sense that your environment around you is really part of another world. You somehow feel detached from your surroundings. Things can feel unreal or altered and not like you normally feel. This in itself can create more anxiety. We like to feel grounded. Depersonalization is when a person experiences that they are disconnected from their own body. Even their thoughts and feelings feel disconnected. It's like you're an observer. It's like you're watching yourself or you're watching what's happening almost like a movie sounds can feel distorted can you feel muffled or far away and you can even feel like you're stuck in a dream or a fog now i've had people who have had those um sensations happen to them and it sometimes can be for a few minutes i've had people who have had it just happen for a few seconds but that few seconds can be very scary. They feel disconnected from their, either their, their personhood, who they are. And that can even escalate um, more anxiety and panic. I don't care where I want to go. Um, let's see what's up. I think I talked about Beck, so we can actually move past Beck and into the next slide. There we go. Stress. Stressful situations, especially prolonged ones. When I mean prolonged, I mean at least a month or more of chronic stress. So that we have a cascade of stress hormones that can produce physiological changes in our body. Maybe we're worried about losing a job or an environmental factor such as a coercive supervisor or demeaning work colleague. Uh, maybe it's um, stress in school, or maybe it's conflict in a marriage. Um, the mind and the body can deal with stress for an acute and distinct period of time. But after that, it begins to take a toll on us. Back in the 1950s, uh, when um, there was a, a psychologist um, his name was Hans Saley. He talked about the stress theory. Um, he had three parts to his theory. He talked about alarm. So when our body kind of goes into an alarm state of fight or flight, sometimes freeze. Um, resistance, which is when the stress kept going on and we kind of resisted that state. And then exhaustion. And so we got exhausted. And this isn't over a very short period of time. Our bodies are kind of equipped to handle stress for short periods of time, but over long periods of time, it really can take a toll on our health. And Sally talked about that. He, he did some research. He um, introduced hormones into um, mice and other animals. And um, he looked at how stress hormones how hormones could affect the nervous system and, and the immune system. And, um, although much of the research has advanced today, he kind of looked at could people develop ulcers or animals, um, or could they develop cardiac issues with chronic stress. And then more research continued to look at how stress can impact health. I'm gonna look at a Bible verse. It's uh, Psalm 139, 14. It tells us that we are fearfully and wonderful made, wonderfully made by our creator. God certainly knew what he was doing when he created our autonomic nervous system. I call it ANS. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about our autonomic nervous system, which we can break it down into two things. It's 
two subsystems, parasympathetic and sympathetic, okay? And what I like to do is I like to use imagery and visualization so that it helps to aid in the understanding and memory of what we are speaking about here. So let's visualize for a moment. Pretend that the autonomic nervous system is a midnight blue push. Anybody like, anybody like uh, fast cars here? <laughs> So this outstanding car has two rather important systems in it, besides the leather seats and how awesome we feel when we get into it. But I wouldn't drive this car if it only had one system. And sometimes, as human beings, one system is online and the other system is not. What I mean by that is one system, maybe the sympathetic nervous system is revving up, it's in control, and the parasympathetic nervous system is not. So one system is the gas and the pedal in the Porsche. And in our bodies, the throttling of the pedal can bring about the fight or flight response to get us out of danger. Just like the Porsche on the freeway, who does not want to be cut off by the semi truck, the pedal can be pushed, the gas can get to the car, and it works. It takes the car out of danger and the person driving it. Right? Well, we call that the, um, the sympathetic nervous system. Okay? That's the one nervous system that takes us out of danger. The other system of the Porsche includes the brakes. And we call this system the parasympathetic nervous system. This system slows things down. In the Porsche, it can be abrupt or slow if it comes to light. Either way, in humans, we need the system to create calm and rest in our bodies. We shouldn't be revving up all the time, and many of us are, with a flood of adrenaline and cortisol hormones. We need peace and restoration, especially after danger or threat has passed. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I remember the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic nervous system. I think of parasympathetic as P or peace. So it just starts with the letter P. So parasympathetic is peace. Peace be with me. I need peace. Want to experience peace. And that is actually what the parasympathetic nervous system does when we engage it. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, I remember it by S, which is or sympathy. Have sympathy on me when I feel so activated that I'm an imminent threat and I need to flee or fight or freeze. And sure. so, and, pardon me? Somebody say something? No, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, those are the parts of this, the subsystems of the stress response. And hopefully we can try to engage that parasympathetic nervous system more often so that we can feel safe and in a, in a, in a place of peace. And that helps with anxiety, it helps with panic, and it helps with stress. There's a book called Revive the Anxious Brain, written by Pittman and Carl, and they have some interesting observations and research that they've done with regards to anxiety. And they talk about the brain, and they talk about the cortex, which is the outer part of the brain, where thinking and cognition takes place, and the frontal lobes, which are part of the cortex. 
frontal lobes, we could create, analyze, decipher, think, process, information, executive functioning. Very helpful for our, for our lives. We also have another structure in the brain called the amygdala. It's part of the limbic system. I have a little picture up there on the slide of the limbic system. It kind of includes the uh, amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the hippocampus. And that structure, it kind of lies, it has part of it is in the right and left hemisphere. Two little, two little almond shaped pieces. Many think of it as one structure, but I think it actually is shared in the, it has, you know, it's kind of duplicated in the right and the left hemisphere. The, and the amygdala is associated with emotional memory, and fear is one of them. It's the little protector of the brain and the body. So think of it as a cute little mini dog, like a little carrier of the brain. The amygdala is associated with fight or flight response used for survival. This little structure is vital to it. It goes on to send messages to other structures in a pace like lightning speed little guy doesn't mess around. It sends immediate messages to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is really the kind of a regulator of the brain and the body in a way because it regulates heart rate, blood pressure, temperature. And that goes on to send messages to other structures of the brain and into the body, increasing um, blood flow, blood vessels to constrict or dilate, adrenaline to flow throughout the body to give us energy so we can flee or fight. Because this little structure of the brain, the amygdala, holds emotional memory, sometimes the cortex isn't even aware of what's happening in the amygdala. It happens so quickly. I'll give you an example. Um, I went on a hike the other day with my family and we were walking in the hills, beautiful, beautiful day. Got up early in the morning, it wasn't too hot. But there are rattlesnakes in the surrounding hills. And so we were walking kind of in a, on a narrow path and there was what I thought, my senses thought, was maybe a snake. I think I was probably thinking about it anyway, but I jumped. So the amygdala actually can sometimes react faster than the cortex can think. It's kind of that survival part of our brain. Well, in that immediate, immediate second, I jumped. And just as I jumped, I realized that's not a snake. That's a stick. It's an interesting looking stick, I'll tell you that. But it's kind of like a survival mechanism within our brain. So the, the authors of um, Rewire Your Ancient Brain, they talk about a woman who has a social phobia and is fearful in, of speaking in front of a group of people. She may try to rationalize with her cortex that she is fearful of being criticized by others. Many of us would, right, if we got in front of a group of people. But if the focus of the possibility of another anxiety structure is not given some significance, then some important knowledge might be lost. The amygdala may be the little protector of the brain. It may actually be remembering something that her cortex is not aware of. A woman over time was able to recall a memory of being chastised by a teacher as a child in a group when she was reading. Her emotional memory was reacting to speaking in front of a group many years later. The two structures are important to be noted. I do think that in some ways they work together, but sometimes one might be a little bit ahead of each other 
and one might not know exactly what the other might be doing immediately. So the amygdala was sending signals to other brain structures, creating a fight or flight response. But the woman was not actually in danger at this time. The little protector was actually not helping her right now. There truly was no fire to put out. There was no danger. But in her brain and body, they were responding as though it was. In this case, rationalizing may not be the most effective way, but rather using skills like deep breathing to calm the nervous system. So when I think of the little amygdala, I visualize that little doggy that I sometimes get to babysit. You guys see the picture of the doggy there sitting on my, on my sofa? That's in my office. I brought her to my office the other day. She was a little sweetheart. She liked all of the clients. She even sat in the lap of one of my clients. He really liked her. He had no idea what a fierce little creature she could be. She weighs about three pounds, but she is a protector. I'll give you a, an example. I really laughed at this. So my grandson is three and I have a husky. And when we go over to my daughter's house for dinner, I bring our husky and um, my grandson drives him crazy. He run, runs around and runs after our husky and the husky tries to get away and runs under the table. And eventually if my grandson bothers for too much, he'll bark, like warning, please stay away from me. It's a high pitch for the bark. Well, little Kita, the little doggy that you just saw in the, in the picture, she came over to visit one day and we went over to my daughter's house. Kita went after my grandson, just like a little protection. She ran all over the yard. My grandson, he was fleeing. He was scared. He was scared of that little dog. And so as people, we want to try to calm this little doggy down in our brain sometimes. Not every knock at the door is an intruder. Authors of Rewire Your Ancient Brain discuss the idea of exposure to begin to change your amygdala's response to a stressor. So if we go back to a person maybe who has social phobia or they're afraid of speaking in front of a group of people, then allowing ourselves to tolerate this distress, work on calm, calming skills, breathing, telling yourself, this is not so bad, I can do this it may actually decrease your stress response the next time you speak. And actually, probably when you are speaking, and eventually your nervous system, the stress hormones will be basically metabolized and you'll be able to get through it. There's the same neurons that fire together, wire together. No one really knows exactly when that was coined, sometime during the neuropsychology era, but that is a very interesting statement, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if we can get neurons that are firing when we are doing something that might be activating, maybe stressful, and yet we work on calming skills, then something that maybe made us very anxious or stressed, we can work on allowing our bodies and our minds to be in a calmer state. And eventually we may not feel so anxious when we're doing something that might be stressed before. Let's see where I'm going here. Let's move past that one slide. Okay. Anxiety is not always a bad thing. Okay. And sometimes I don't think it is. When clients come to my office and they're speaking about anxiety and experiencing it, I often ask them, what's going on in your life? Where could this anxiety be stemming from? Sometimes what we find is that anxiety might be stemming from something else that we didn't even think about. It could be stemming from an unresolved issue. Maybe an argument with a parent that was never repaired, a neighbor that you had a conflict with, and now you don't speak to it all. 
your anxiety is telling you something about yourself. And so we want to address it. Maybe we need to confront it and look at it and see what can be done here. So it may not actually just be anxiety, but it actually may be something that lies beneath that. It could be sadness. Maybe it's loneliness. Society is lonely. Maybe it's anger. Take a moment and think about that. Maybe your experience is like that. And sometimes you feel anxiety because something isn't resolved. Maybe there's something in a relationship that's not resolved in your life. So other emotions, underlying emotions, may be creating more anxiety for you. Move on to the next slide. It's uh, calming the anxious mind. There we go. Great book. In calming the anxious mind, um, the authors discuss a study. They look at different people with different stress outcomes and how attitudes and beliefs are related to physical health. And they noted three elements. I call them three C's. I don't know if they did, but I looked at it and said commitment, goal, and challenge. It all makes sense. But let's say there's a stressful event that is occurring. We kind of look at our stress hardiness. One element is commitment. The deep interest and involvement in what is happening around you, to you and to others. We have a, an interest and a sense of connection to what is happening. Another element is control. Feeling or thinking confidently that you have the ability to do something to lessen the destructiveness of whatever that stressful event is. Maybe you feel you have really good assertiveness skills that you just learned. And wow, I can take those into the work situation. I can take some control over this difficult situation. Maybe you feel like you have the power to influence it. It's good at that. The last C is challenge. And that's really how we perceive or view things. Viewing a stressful event as an opportunity for change or growth. Like, what could I do here? Oh, how can I step back and look more objectively and more from a positive perspective? And so when people have different ways of looking at things. Maybe they're more pessimistic. Their stress hardiness may actually be less than those who tend to be more positive, have a greater sense of control, and look at a stressful event as a challenge, something where we need a lot to do. I'm gonna quote something from a daily devotional that I read all the time. I love to read it in the morning. It's called Psalms to Soothe a Woman's Heart. That's not on that's not on here. We'll just stay right there when the book is And in this daily devotional, the writer says, Whatever troubles you are facing, there is no reason for despair. God hears you and will help you. Call to him. Lay your burdens at his feet. He is always available to speak peace to your soul. So for me, sometimes I stay on just a few pages in that devotional and I read them and I begin to change my perspective. I begin to challenge myself and think, what can I learn from this? Is it that maybe positive can come out of my experience? By paying attention to our own thoughts, especially those that are negative and fear-based, we can learn to be present with the thoughts. We may even choose to reframe a thought and see the problem from another perspective. I'm going to go on to mindfulness, which is on the next slide. Dr. Hill? Dr. Hill? Yes. Um, we want to um, allow time for Q&A. So can you wrap it up for? Sure. Sure. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Sorry. Right. No problems. Okay. So let me ask you guys, 
I have mindfulness to talk about and a little bit about meditation. And then I have some coping skills. So why don't I go to the coping skills? Okay. Since we are, um, we have a little time. Let's, let's go forward. Okay. Let's look at this one. Walking. May sound simple, but honestly, walking can help reduce anxiety. When we walk, we use both all of our body parts. We're using our legs and our arms and our hands. And there's a crossover in our brain where I use, when we use our left leg, our right, the right part of our brain is, is actually working. So walking can actually de-stress us. And it's also a good time to just be alone, have time for yourself. I talked about um, that exercise that, that kind of falls into walking, but anything cardiovascular that we do can help our stress level. Um, I run in the morning. I started doing that about a half a year ago, or maybe even maybe even more, and it really helped. Especially, you know, since we couldn't go many places, running in the morning was really good for me. I'd take my dog out and go for a run. Let's move to the next slide quickly. Exercise, let's go forward one more. Date methods. This may sound silly, you guys. Use Netflix or other formats wisely, but happily, okay? I've had clients who've come to me and said, my brain just won't shut off. I've just been so anxious and stressed today. I started watching a movie that was nothing like my life and I got lost in it and fell asleep. Sometimes reading a book or just getting out of what is going on in our lives can help us to sink for a little while and relax and it distracts us. Let's go on to the next slide. Getting into nature, okay. That's something I think that during COVID, many of us, even though I don't think that the, you know, the forests and the trees and the beaches of the earth were filled with the COVID virus, we, a lot of us isolated and we couldn't go to the beaches because they shut them down or we couldn't go, we couldn't go for hikes because the um, hills were closed. Um, but getting back in touch with nature can help us feel more grounded and a greater sense of peace. Do I have any more time? About two minutes. Okay. All right. Well, being creative, journaling, writing a poem, playing games, they're great distractors and they make us laugh. Laughing and, and, and forgetting the world's woes, forgetting our world woes can help us to be less stressed and less anxious. Eating, okay. Um, if anybody has questions later, um, there's also some su supplements that can be helpful. But um, trying to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, because interestingly enough, the food we eat winds up becoming the neurotransmitters in our brain and body. So if we're not eating well, if we're eating fast food or we're eating a bunch of junk food, then we're actually depriving our own body from creating the neurotransmitters that are necessary for a healthy lifestyle. Move to the next one. And again, when we're having a lot of anxiety and stress or even panic, sometimes we, we can't sleep very well, but good sleep habits can really be important. Um, reducing noise and light. And that saying, count your sheep, you know, count the sheep, right? Well, I have clients who, they don't just count their sheep. Sometimes if they can't sleep and they're very anxious, they think of a time in their life. Maybe it was a vacation or it was something in their childhood that brings them a sense of peace. And they go there at night. They purposely start thinking about a memory. And what they find is they fall asleep because they're not thinking about negative, anxious, worrisome thoughts. They're more thinking about positive, uplifting thoughts before they go to bed. All right. Um, do I have one more slide on there? Is that it? Oh, okay. So that's the last one before we get into question asking. So relax a little and enjoy the moments of life. 
life is more than anxiety and stress. And I, I took that picture there. I love Hawaii and sunsets are just very peaceful and beautiful. And they could bring a sense, even we don't have to be in Hawaii, right? We can literally be in Southern California. We can sit in our backyards or go to the beach or you know, go for a walk and see a beautiful sunset and just let that part of God's creation fill our minds and our souls and our bodies and find a sense of peace and reduce all of those things that I just talked about, anxiety, stress, and stress. Okay. I think I'm good. And I'd 